Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and I'm really delighted to have been invited by um, Professor Bambung and the uh, Sabepanas uh, Minister to uh, make this presentation, and I'm really delighted that the first IDF is on this topic. Uh, I think that's a very good sign. Um, it was gr it's great to be back to Indonesia. I worked on Indonesia quite a lot in the 1980s and 90s. It's great to see the progress that Indonesia's made. Um, it's not so great to see how unevenly that progress has been spread, but still, there's some good signs there as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, can you see, where's the presentation? Well, the, the main thing is I can see it. Um, technology. Am I missing something here? Can we uh, <laughs> can we put the PowerPoint up? Okay. Um, all right. Technology is working so smoothly until I started. Somebody working on this? Ah, <laughs> a little bit smaller. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, messages for this talk. Um, most of the developing world, including Indonesia, has made huge progress against absolute poverty. That's the good news, and I'm going to show you some evidence on that. Um, the the not so good news is that there are really continuing challenges in addressing inequality rising inequality in many countries, not all countries, signs of rising inequality in Indonesia, a serious policy concern, uh, issues of relative poverty, and very importantly, this issue of are we leaving nobody behind? Are the poorest being captured by the processes of economic growth that we're seeing in the developing world? Uh, also good news, the policies do exist. We can address concerns about poverty and inequality in a real way, absolute poverty, we can eliminate it. We can eliminate it within a generation. We know how to do it. The biggest issues, in my view, are political will and administrative uh, effectiveness. The uh, capability for actually implementing the policies that we, we know about, we've learnt about. We're going to learn more, of course, more research is going to be needed, but I point to the importance of both political will and administrative cap capability for effective implementation, including, of course, financing. Uh, roadmap of this talk. Well, first, a little bit on the, on the philosophy of this, the ethics. Why are we concerned about inequality and poverty? And I think it's really important to step back and, 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 and think a bit about that, because uh, economists are often ignoring this and, and that's to their peril. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're doing. What does the evidence look like, including for Indonesia? Uh, lastly, how can we do better? What are the kinds of policies we can point to for addressing these concerns? Uh, and, and here I'm not going to... It's no magic bullets, as I think Jeff Sachs pointed out, in, a, in, a, in a, an economy as complex as Indonesia's, we're not going to find a single magic bullet for eliminating poverty, for reducing inequality. But I'm going to point to a number of recommendations for thinking better, more positively, about these policies. Okay, why do we care? I think it's in our biology. Primatologists have taught us this by studying animals and the way they react to unfair situations. It's really built into us. We care about 
uh, unequal trades, we care about uh, unequal opportunities in life. Uh, it, it's, it's in our biology. It's something fundamental to, to uh, um, advanced organisms. Uh, we also care about un unequal outcomes in life. Uh, utilitarians have taught us that for a, a long time, but I'm not a utilitarian, but I respect the, the, the utilitarian perspective. Um, also in part because unequal outcomes today can mean unequal opportunities in the future. And finally, we care about specific inequalities. Inequalities of gender, of race, the things that stem from discrimination in society, and these are objectionable. On the economic side, there's a whole host of reasons why we care about inequality, if, even if we don't put much weight on the ethical arguments. Um, I don't agree with this, but if I was to say that economic growth is the sole objective of development, I'd also say that we need to worry about inequality and poverty. These are things which constrain economic growth. We used to think of it as all just a relationship from growth to inequality. We now understand there's a reverse relationship. All kinds of ways uh, in unequal societies, in market, when markets are not working perfectly for credit, land, labor, there are all kinds of ways in which the initial endowments in the economy can impede the progress of that economy as a whole. And they also impede the prospects of poor people participating in economic growth. Inequality and distribution are fundamental to economic outcomes. Development economics has known this and versions of this for a long time. And uh, I'm very famously um, the great development economist, Arthur Lewis, uh, who, who, amongst other achievements, won the Nobel Prize, and uh, I think the first development economist to do so. Arthur Lewis once pointed out uh, development is inevitably unequal because it doesn't start everywhere at the same time. There's an, 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 an inevitable unevenness to growth processes. That's true, and we've got to recognize that fact. There is going to be inequality in growing, developing economies. That doesn't mean we can't manage it. And the key point that I think Lewis was also making is that as long as the poor do participate in that growth process, as long as that people do catch up, we'll be quite happy with the situation. But that's, that's a, an important question, do they? There are also views that say that even if, um, even if we accept that, that um, po poverty is a, it trumps inequality, uh, even if we accept that, we may be concerned about inequality now, high-end inequality, the kinds of concerns that uh, Tom Piketty and, and Joe Stiglitz have pointed to, high-end inequality coming from high returns to rentiers and societies, their idle children, a transmission of a new gilded age. I don't think this is yet a concern, a major concern for Indonesia, but it's a very much a concern for countries like America, where I live. Concerns that will, be, will undermine long-term prospects for growth and poverty reduction in those, in those economies. They will not become nice places. Some inequalities matter more, and here I really point to the importance of inequality of, op of opportunity. In other words, um, the inequalities, inequality is a big word. We need to unpack it. And one important aspect is the opportunities people face in life. How much the conditions of their birth determine their prospects in the future. Another concern is absolute inequality. I flag this as important because I, I've come to realize that the way possibly half the people in the world think about inequality is actually quite different to the way uh, economists typically think about inequality. Economists like me, I was trained to think about inequality in a very particular way, about ratios of incomes. In economics, it's something called the, the scale independence axiom. Um, but I also have come to realize that that's not how most people necessarily think about inequality. Have a look at these numbers. Imagine there's a distribution of income in a world, incomes one, two, and three, you can think of it as you know, $1 a day, $2 a day, $3 a day, or $1 an hour, $2 an hour. It's a distribution of income in society. And suppose that it changes into this distribution 2, 4, and 6. And just think to yourself, has inequality changed? The way I was taught about inequality, and 
my PhD supervisor was the late Tony Atkinson, and, and one of the, the, the great contributors to this topic. The way Atkinson's sin, the tradition of, of um, formal inequality analysis proceeds, it says that inequality is identical in state A and state B. When I talk to people, many of them, not all, but many of them say that inequality is higher in state B. They look at the gap between the six and the two, they compare it to the three and the one, and they see that it's, it's, it's so much larger, it's doubled. That's absolute inequality. If you look at those numbers, and you think that inequality has risen, then you think about inequality in absolute terms. That's not wrong. I'm perfectly happy for you to do that. But it's actually very important when we talk about inequality and development to know how you think about inequality. Lots of the globalization debate, I believe, is a debate about a debate between people who think about inequality in absolute terms and people who think about inequality in relative terms. It's a debate about the concepts of inequality. If you think about inequality in absolute terms, you're seeing rising absolute inequality in a place like Indonesia. If you think about it in relative terms, well, not so clear. Falling for some period, rising in recent times, and stabilizing lately. How are we doing? Um, a very short history. People don't realize <laughs> global inequality global relative inequality between all people in the world has been falling. It's been falling since the whole new millennium. It's been falling since back in the 1990s. Global inequality. That's actually the reversal of the long-run trend. If you go back 100 years or more before that, inequality was rising globally. As the, advanced, as the countries that are advanced today started to industrialize, they took off, left a lot of the world behind. That was a rise in global inequality. In the new millennium, and since the 1990s, global inequality is falling. But it's falling in a very particular way. It's falling because of economic convergence. It's falling because of the growth in countries like Indonesia. If we unpack total global inequality, it looks like this, going back to the about 1990. On the top there, you have total global inequality. And then I've broken it up into two components, the inequality between countries and the inequality within countries. Between countries is really the whole story, pretty much. Why global inequality is falling is the inequality between countries. If you look within countries, there's actually a slight edging up. Average population weighted, average inequality in the, in the world is creeping upwards. But then you look at some countries, Indonesia. Indonesia inequality was falling from about 1970 to some time in the 1990s, and then it started a new trend, upwards. It's, it's, not a, it's a bit worrying when I look at it. A trend increase of, in the Gini index of 0.05 per 10 years, that means if that continues in 10 years' time, Indonesia will have the inequality of Brazil, one of the highest, most unequal countries in the world. But that, that proviso, if the trend continues, that's absolutely critical. We've got some signs that there was a period of falling inequality during the 1990s crisis, but I don't recommend crises to deal with inequality, okay? Uh, we're also seeing signs of stabilization in the recent years. I put a question mark on that because we don't fully understand why that's happening. We do need to understand it better. What about poverty? Uh, the story here is one of falling absolute poverty in the world as a whole, going back 200 years, there's no doubt about that. Ups and downs, but a general decline. But we also need to think about relative poverty, not just absolute poverty. We can think of it as a lower bound and an upper bound to the true measure of poverty. The lower bound is an absolute line, meaning that the line is fixed in real terms over time and across countries. Relative poverty, on the other hand, the poverty line moves with the mean. Most developing countries use absolute poverty lines. Indonesia is actually an exception, it's one of the few. Indonesia uses an implicitly relative line. The BPS doesn't quite say that, but it is an implicitly relative line. 
Then, okay, let's look at the two. Here we have the lower bound and the upper bound going back to about 1990 again. The good news is we're seeing progress in absolute poverty and in relative poverty. That's really good news. It's a particular kind of relative poverty. Um, it's what I call weekly relative. But the key point here is that we're seeing with the decline in the numbers of people living below this frugal absolute standard, here I've used the World Bank's $1.90 a day poverty line, which uh, is an update of a, of a line I developed before that, but it's, it's uh, um, you know, one reasonable number. Um, the upper bound here is essentially saying, if you're, you're to be not poor, to be above the upper bound, to be contrary to somebody who's not poor, they have to be neither poor by this uh, common global international standard, $1.90, they also have to be not poor by standards typical of the country they live in. So there are two, two hurdles. You've got to give a, get above the global international standard and you've got to get above the standard that's typical of the country you live in at that time. So that's good news. In fact, we're on track to achieving SDG 1 to eliminate the lower bound poverty within by about 2030, 2035. Um, I'm not sure that last few percent may be a lot harder. Um, but but the, I'm, I'm re still reasonably confident. What about Indonesia? Well, here's the upper and lower bound. Nobody's seen this before. I just did it for, for Indonesia. What, here's the striking thing. Look at this. Laser pointer doesn't work. But look at the crisis. Um, it, it's, it's such a strong feature of these data. But the general trend is downward for both the upper bound and the lower bound. That's very good. Both absolute and relative poverty are falling in Indonesia. Uh, if we look at numbers of poor, the top picture there is percentages of people. If we look at numbers of poor, what we're seeing is a, a substantial decline in the numbers of absolutely poor people, but many of those are now relatively poor. We're seeing a rising number of people who are relatively poor but not absolutely poor in Indonesia. Okay, this question. When I, when I read things that people write about poverty in the world, I hear these statements. Here I, I'll quote none other than ex-UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Poor, the poorest of the world are being left behind. We need to reach out and lift them into our lifeboat. Guy Ryder, the head of the ILO. Poverty is not yet defeated. Uh, far too many people are being left behind. When I see, when, at first when I see quotes like that, statements like that, my first reaction is, haven't they read the literature? Haven't they read my papers? <laughs> Don't they know poverty's falling and growth is doing most of the work? That's, that's, that's the reality. And then I thought about it. Maybe, they, maybe they're talking about something I'm not talking about. Maybe, just like that absolute inequality difference versus relative inequality, maybe they're looking at the data in a different way. Actually, I've come to the view that they have. Ah, the picture on the left are, are two cumulative distribution functions. They're just giving you the percentage of people living below any point in the distribution. So, if I talk about a poverty rate of 20%, that's saying that 20% of people live below a particular point in the distribution. And here I've just given you the picture for all the points, all the possible poverty lines. But I've given it in two ways. On the left here, the poverty rate has fallen between this distribution and that distribution by a substantial amount. On the right, it's fallen, also fallen by the same amount. I, I've, I've drawn it that way. We see this decline. But there's a big difference. On the left, the floor has stayed put. So here's a situation where poverty fell, but the poorest were left behind. The support of the distribution did not increase. The lower bound, the floor, if you like. On the right, it did. And in fact, none of the numbers that I've shown you, or n none of the numbers that we ever look at, including BPS numbers and so on, are telling us what is happening to the floor. Are, is the bottom rising? Is it the picture on the left? 
or is it a picture on the right? That's actually quite critical. If you think about social policy, we think about arguments for things like minimum wage rates, social policy arguments. <sighs> Sorry. Um, we think of arguments like this. Here's one of my favorite quotes from any um, uh, political figure, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, uh, just before he was assassinated, Mahatma was asked by a politician in India. The politician asked Gandhi, how do I judge my success? And Mahatma's answer was, recall the face of the poorest and weakest person you have ever seen and ask if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use. That is the same point. Ask yourself, are the poorest benefiting? Are you raising the floor? That's a rights-based argument. It's not a standard utilitarian argument, the type of arguments economists are used to. It's a rights-based argument. And of course, rights, you don't achieve rights on average. Rights are things that you achieve for everybody. So if you're leaving somebody behind, maybe it's not just that you know, occasionally this happens, but if you're systematically leaving people behind, that's a problem. Social policies try to reverse that. What's happening in the world? We are leaving people behind. This is a picture I created. I've given you the absolute gain in the developing world as a whole by percentiles of the distribution. So the poorest on the left here, the richest on the right. Those are the absolute gains in real terms over 30 years for the developing world as a whole. Look at that. Nearly zero at the bottom. There's that rise in absolute inequality. In terms of those two pictures I showed you, it's the one on the left. That's for the developing world. What about the world as a whole? Isn't that incredible? That is what's happening. Nearly zero at the bottom. Absolute gains that are going through the roof at the very top. That's the world as a whole. The very top percentiles, it, it, the line goes even higher probably. Here's another way of looking at it. This is the overall mean consumption in the developing world. Strikingly, we got to a new growth trajectory in, in around 2000. Growth rates went from a long-run growth rate of about 2% per person per year to 4% per person per year. Fantastic. That's great news. But look at the blue line. The blue line is my estimate of the lower bound of consumption, the support of the distribution of permanent consumption the lowest level, typically lowest level of living in the world over time. It hasn't risen. One or two cents. In other words, what's happened since 2000, the mean has increased, but it hasn't pulled up the bottom. What about Indonesia? This is a bit better. Again, here's that crisis. We're seeing a little bit, a bit better than the, the developing world as a whole. But, but I think, I hope one can do better. I'm going to talk a bit about why that's the case in right now. Policies for assuring that we do better. First and foremost, economic growth remains crucial, especially in poor places. Growth has been distribution neutral on average. Growth has been approximate cause of absolute poverty reduction. We find little evidence of a serious trade-off. It's not a major issue. You can have your cake and eat it too. If you do the policies the right way, you can have falling inequality with growth. You can also get into a virtuous cycle. 
a degree of redistribution, smart redistribution in high inequality countries uh, is likely to be good for growth and it's very likely to be able to support policies that are also good for poor people over the longer term. Growth is fantastic for financing redistribution. Redistribution can also, the right kinds of redistribution, particularly in high inequality countries, can be really good for promoting growth. So you can get into a virtuous cycle. How do you do that? This is my list of favourite policies. Develop human physical assets of poor people, make markets work better for poor people, remove negative discrimination, remove biases against the poor, um, invest in local public goods and infrastructure, remove restrictions on migration between and within countries. Um, most countries don't have restrictions on migration within the country, um, but some do, or the famous HUCO system in China, and, and, and really that's a first order poverty issue for the world as a whole, eliminating the registration system in China. Also finding faster ways to foster labour absorption from urban economies is really key. Investing in local public goods and infrastructure. Uh, there's still tons of biases against the poor in public spending and taxation and pricing and regulation, all kinds of things we can just fix. Do less damage. In all of this, I very much agree with that prioritization that Jeff Sachs uh, said, that uh, human development, particularly education, is going to be central. That's correct. For a country such as Indonesia, education expansion is going to be pro-poor. I say that with a qualifier because it's not necessarily true. In, in low-income countries, education expansion can actually come with a cost to inequality. In Indonesia, it's a stage of development where that's not the case, no longer the case. We've also got a lot of new evidence on the importance of early childhood development. We're learning that it's not just about what you do at school from age five, it's preconditions. It's the, 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 the extent to which you, your parents talk to you as a kid, the amount of interaction you have, the nature of that interaction. Human development, child development from an early age is crucial for, for not just the, the welfare of those kids, but for avoiding these cycles of poverty across generations that we see everywhere. Redistributive policies uh, that complement economic growth. Here I think there are some lessons from the advanced economies. It's really quite striking how much on average the advanced economies of the world do in fact reduce inequality. They're doing it less than they used to, but here's the difference. The average Gini for market incomes in the, in the advanced countries is 0.49. The average Gini for disposable income is 0.31. So it's a sizable average redistribution going on. Fiscal incidence in Indonesia doesn't look nearly as good. Here's the, um, there's an estimate by, uh, um, at, uh, in a project led by Nora Lustig of, market, of the uh, Gini coefficient for market incomes in Indonesia, and that's final incomes, which in Indonesia context is consumption. Not so good. Indonesia's redistribution package of taxes, transfers, and so on is bringing the Gini coefficient down just a little bit. Um, Brazil, for example, is bringing it down a whole lot more. But remember, you know, be fair here, uh, Brazil has a lot more inequality to deal with at present. If the trend continues in Indonesia, we'll be facing something like the same problem Brazil has and we'll need massive redistribution effort. Greater use of these interventions we're seeing in the developing world. I'm going to uh, speed up here because I've got this thing flashing at me, time's up, and I, 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 that's, I don't agree with that. <laughs> but I, on the timing. But let me show you one picture. How, this is really the question. How, how are we doing in this redistributive effort? Um, Fifteen years ago, most developing countries did not have anything you could say was a, a safety net of any form, any effort to directly redistribute in favour of poor people. That has changed. We now estimate about one billion people are receiving some form of help from social safety nets, a broad set of policies, direct interventions. They're called different things, social assistance and so on, but a package of transfer, typically transfer-based policies that try, explicitly try, to reach poor people. 
the problem is that for developing countries that's not working very well. Here we have a plot on the vertical axis, this is from the Aspire data set managed by the World Bank. On the vertical axis we have safety net coverage, the percentage of the population covered by those safety nets that I'm talking about, plotted against GDP per capita. Two things to note here. Um, in general, poorer countries are, have lower coverage. One of the kind of ironies of being a poor country is that you're less effective <laughs> at reaching your poor. And that's partly the part of the reason why you're a poor country. Also note, as you, as you go up the income ladder, countries get better at reaching their poor. So the blue line here is the coverage rate for the poor is 20%. The lines are diverging. Actually for Indonesia, this is Indonesia, this is the blue, the red line is for the population as a whole, and the blue line is for the poorest quintile, the divergence is quite good. In other words, the coverage rate is what we would expect of a country of, of Indonesia's average income, but the coverage rate for the poor is, is a bit above what we'd expect. That's good news. All kinds of constraints here that we have to recognize. Good policy here is about acknowledging the constraints. Uh, administrative capacity is key. Too often I see governments and developing countries and at state level as well as national level that are doing all kinds of stuff that they just don't have the capacity to do. So first and most important, adapt to that capacity. Avoid high marginal tax rates. Perfect targeting is one of the worst possible anti-poverty policies because of the, the incentive effects of perfect targeting. If you perfectly target, you're creating a poverty trap. 100% marginal tax rates on poor people. Not a good idea. They won't get out of poverty that way. I think we need to relax a lot about targeting. Perfect targeting is an extreme, meaning I exactly fill those poverty gaps, but um, we need to relax a lot about it. The whole set of menu of pol current policies, I've listed uh, the policies in practice now. Um, I'll give you some examples from various countries that uh, I've worked in. Public services, cash transfers, microfinance, workfare schemes, minimum wage rates if enforceable, progressive income tax when possible, and clearly and very important, strong tax enforcement, particularly on, on the rich. Expanding the administrative capability to raise taxes efficiently and effectively is going to be key. Okay, I'm going to end with six recommendations. Tailor policies to the realities of the setting. Seems sort of obvious, doesn't it? But as I just said, that's not what's happening a lot of the time. Tap local information, but with effective state support. Sure, community-based development is a great idea, but don't use it as an alternative to strong local states. That's a terrible idea. You need strong local states to, to monitor, to enforce, to deal with grievance redressal, and so on. Focus on poverty reduction, not targeting. This whole targeting idea has gone too far. I've mentioned the problems of hard, high marginal tax rates, but there are other issues too. The breakdown of social solidarity that arises. You go to a village and you see what two identical people, one's treated differently to the other because some so-called proxy means test has favoured one over the other. We've gone too far on this. Relax about targeting. Protect and promote. This is a smart social policy idea. Look for ways in which we do protect poor people, but we also help promote them out of poverty. Conditional cash transfer is an obvious example. Monitor and evaluate. And last, learn from mistakes. One of the frustrations I have as somebody, I teach evaluation, I do evaluation a lot. One of the frustrations I have all the time is governments that don't only listen when the news is good. Your program's doing well? Oh, terrific. Your program's doing badly? Silence. We need to learn from our mistakes. There's a, an NGO called um, 
It goes to Give Directly. They have a website, and on this, pa one of their, on this website, one page is devoted to learning their mistakes, which is terrific. I wish all governments had that website with that page, and it was full of admissions of their mistakes. On the first mistake that uh, Give Well, or Give Directly, well, the first mistake that it, it acknowledges is that it didn't hire PhD economists to help evaluate its policies. So clearly I, I'm even more happy. You can read more about this in, in my book, a little bit of advertisement, Economics of Poverty, and my forthcoming wider lecture, Terry McCassey. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Yeah, do, do we? Yes, of course. Okay. We have uh, approximately 10 minutes. All right, great. Why is this thing being saying time's up since five minutes into the court? <laughs> okay, Qu questions. Who's going to manage the question time? Do I do it? We've got one right here. Please, stand up. Can we get a mic? Thank you, sir. My name is Mubarak Ahmad from Faculty of Economics, University of Indonesia. Um, you, you use a lot of um, terminologies in your ter uh, lecture, including some used by only by sociologists. But one thing that you didn't mention at all, which is displacement. Why is economics displacement, marginalization of people? Uh, when, but the content of your talks uh, contains so much about, about that issue, I think. But wh why economists is so reluctant in using that while that's the reality of the way government okay. is doing development this day? I, I don't know why, but I promise you, on the next talk I give, I'm going to use that word. <laughs> next question. We, I saw one hand over here. Microphone. Blue, blue top. Only one other question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Megawanti. I'm one of uh, ORD from LPDP. My question is, uh, how can education influencing poverty and inequality? Thank you. H how can what? Education. Education? Yes. You don't talk about education at all. Yes, I did. <laughs> no, uh, what I mean is, uh, you talk about more about economy than education, but I ah. don't. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I, I, I did, but okay, it's all a bit of a balancing act. It was late in the talk. Um, uh, but I did, uh, as you, you surely heard, as, as Jeff Sachs said, I, I would agree with that prioritization, education number one. Um, I, I, I presented it as human development because I think there's a package of education and health and social protection things that we have to think about. But same basic point. Uh, of course, the key thing is getting the education to poor people. Everywhere in the world, advanced country, poorest country, same thing. The poorer you are, the less education you get and the less good quality education you get. So every country has got that problem. Some countries have done better than others. Indonesia is making a lot of effort in this area, but there's a lot more to do. So it's not education full stop. It's getting the schooling to those who aren't getting it now, which tends to be the poor. You said one time for one more question? No, nope. we, don't, we don't have That's time it. anymore. Time is up. Thank, Thank you very, you much, very for much for concluding the session. Thank you. A big round of applause. Thank you very much, Professor. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the next session of this Indonesia Development Forum will be the Inspire Plenary Session. This Inspire Plenary Session will be led by our session host, Mr. Alfito Di Nova from CNN Indonesia. Kami persilakan Bapak Alfito Di Nova.